Welcome to October. The month of October begins for us on the podcast, and this month we're celebrating the Reformation together. Uh, Martin Luther's great stand against the Pope and against Rome's spiritual abuses and theological errors. Luther did not stand alone, of course. Other men stood for this same cause with him, uh, both before and after him. People like John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, Thomas Cranmer, John Knox, and John Calvin, and many other lesser known names paid the ultimate price uh, in the Reformation as well. Men and women, uh, even teenagers who stood against Rome and who were bled and burned and drowned for their convictions. These stories of sacrifice are our focus in the month ahead in a 31-day tour that you can complete in just about five to seven minutes a day. It's called Here We Stand. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the email journey today online at desiringgod.org forward slash stand, or just go to desiringgod.org and click on the link at the top of the website. I hope you'll join us in remembering the price paid for the spiritual blessings and the religious liberties that we enjoy today as Protestant Christians. And speaking of church history again, the birthday of Jonathan Edwards falls on Saturday on October 5th. Pastor John, on Monday, we talked about Christian zeal, uh, an old-fashioned word, but an important one. You called zeal an essential virtue to Christian obedience. And to make the case, you quoted Paul's biblical exhortations like in Romans, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. That's Romans 12, 11. And in Titus, we read, Christ gave himself for us to purify for himself a people who are zealous for good works. That's Titus 2, 13 to 14. Then you brought up Jonathan Edwards and his 70 resolutions that he made as a young man, especially the one that you can recite from memory almost 50 years since you first read it namely number six, resolved to live with all my might while I do live. But here's today's question. Both you and Edwards are Christian hedonists, and he is a major source of your own understanding of Christian hedonism, a point that uh, was not made clear last time as you were talking about zeal. Does Edwards see a connection between zeal and delight in God? And do you And do you see a connection between zeal to live with all of our might for the glory of God and the Christian hedonist passion to maximize his joy in God? How do you make that connection between our zeal and our joy? Yes. And the best way, I think, to see it is to follow a certain sequence of thought in Edward's mind and my mind that moves from one zeal for the glory of God, to two, zeal for good deeds, to three, the inner motivation of those deeds in love for God or delight in God or treasuring God, different ways to say the same thing, to four, the Christian hedonist principle that we should seek to maximize, zealously seek to maximize in every way we can our joy in God now and forever. So let's try to follow that sequence of thought, and we're going to bump into another amazing resolution of Edwards that really brings clarity to his Christian hedonism. Remember in Romans 12, Paul said, never flag in zeal, serve the Lord. So clearly, Christian zeal is directed towards serving the Lord. And since the Lord is not needy, he doesn't doesn't need any servants to make up for any lack in himself, what that means is that we should avail ourselves of his power to do his bidding to make him look great. Mm. I think that's what serve the Lord means. So the Apostle Paul said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do everything to the glory of of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Everything in our lives should be calculated to make God look more glorious than people think he is. So Edwards defines Christian zeal as a fervent disposition or affection of mind in pursuing the glory of God. That's step one. Step two, this zeal for God's glory implies being zealous for good deeds, good deeds to people, because this is one crucial way God is glorified. So Titus 2.14 says that Christ died to create a people who are zealous for good deeds. And Jesus said in Matthew 5.16, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds 
and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So that's step two. Zeal for God's glory implies zeal for good deeds, since that's how Jesus said we will glorify the Father. Or as Edward says, Christian zeal is a, quote, fervency of spirit that good may be done for God's and Christ's sake. So here's step three. It's to realize that good deeds toward man and outward acts of worship toward God are of no spiritual value without a new heart that loves God, values God, delights in God, treasures God above all else. So Jesus said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain emptiness do they worship me. Matthew 15, 8. Outward acts of worship without inward affections of love are worthless. And Jesus speaks of moral acts of good deeds in the same way. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Matthew 23, 26. They did all kinds of good deeds, the Pharisees did, but were hypocrites because those deeds were not coming from the right kind of heart. They just wanted to be seen by men. So, if we want our zeal for the glory of God to be real, and we want our zeal for good deeds to be morally significant in God's sight, we must be changed on the inside so that we value and treasure God above all things. Or to say it another way, we must delight in God, be glad in God find God to be our superior satisfaction so that our outward acts of worship are authentic and our good deeds towards people serve to glorify the value of God and not ourselves. Psalm 1611, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Tasting that, right now, tasting that in the heart is the heart of worship. And at the horizontal level of good deeds, Jesus said, it is more blessed, more glad, more happy, more satisfying to give than to receive. Acts 20, 35. We should find more gladness in good deeds than in having security and comfort and riches. That's true now in measure. And he says it's true lavishly in the future. Blessed are you. When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad for great. I mean, that's an understatement, right? Yeah. Great is your reward in heaven, mm-hmm. Matthew 5, 11, and 12, which leads to step four. Namely, if this is true, if worship is authentic because our hearts are treasuring and delighting in and being satisfied with God above all things, And if good deeds are morally significant because of the present experience of gladness and blessedness, and because of a future hope of reward in God, then we simply cannot be indifferent to the pursuit of joy in God Himself. And the joy that comes from the overflow of that Godward joy into the lives of other people through good deeds, we can't be indifferent to that joy. We must pursue it with zeal, with passion, with all our might, which is what makes us Christian hedonists. That was a long (laughs) argument to get to the point that, yes, there's a connection (laughs) between zeal for God's glory and being a Christian hedonist. Here's the amazing way Edwards connected zeal with the pursuit of this joy in God. This just boggled my mind when I first read it. Number 22, resolved to endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world, that is, in God, in, in heaven, or in the, in the age to come, not in earthly ease. Start over. Resolved to endeavor 
to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world as I possibly can with all the power, might, vigor, vehemence, yea, violence I am capable of or can bring myself to exert in any way that can be thought of, end quote. That's just an off-the-charts zealous yeah. <laughs> for joy, zealous for happiness with God in heaven forever. That's like saying, resolved to live with all my might while I do live. There's the connection between Christian hedonism and zeal in his own resolution language. To live with all my might while I do live, namely, in the pursuit of of maximum joy in God, with Him, forever, by whatever means on earth I can. And of course, that means by doing as many good deeds as I can, even if it costs me my violent death. That's the point of referring to violence. It's not violence against others he's talking about, but the kind of violence that cuts off your hand or tears out your own eye if it would diminish your doing of good and your avoidance of sin and your experience of joy in God through loving other people. So, my conclusion, Tony, is yes, yes, there is a powerful connection in Edward's mind, there certainly is in my mind, between zeal to live with all our might for the glory of God and the Christian hedonist passion to maximize our joy in God. They come together as our joy in God extends itself to make God look great through deeds of love. We pursue our joy in the joy of others in God, because zeal for his glory and for their good impels us in the Christian hedonist pursuit of maximum joy in God forever. Wonderful. Thank you for that logical sequence, Pastor John. Zealous for happiness with God in heaven forever. Beautiful. It's a nice lead up to Jonathan Edwards' birthday on Saturday and a nice lead in to what is up next time. On Monday, we return to an objection made against Christian hedonism. We are pleasure seekers. We seek our highest happiness. We zealously seek to maximize in every way we can our joy in God now and forever. That's how Pastor John just put it today. And such a commitment to the zealous pursuit of personal joy raises a question about self-denial. How does self-denial fit in Christian hedonism? Great question. That's up next time. And again, be sure to sign up for the Here We Stand email journey or just go to DesiringGod.org and click on the link on the top of the website. I'm Tony Ranke. We'll see you on Monday.